And hello everyone, and this is Dr. Jorge Figueroa, and welcome once again to our uh, TW COPE Research Inclusion and Innovation Speaker Series. Uh, today we have another great guest speaker, uh, which I'm going to be reading his bio. Um, Jorge Burmiki is an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at Howard University. His research examines the leadership pipeline in higher education with an emphasis on racially minoritized leaders at minority serving institutions, community colleges and regional universities. His work also explores policies and practices that support the educational outcomes of men of color, specifically the impact of men of color programs and initiatives on a student success. Dr. Burmiki received his PhD in educational leadership and policy from the University of Texas at Austin, UT Austin. Prior to joining the faculty at Howard University, he was an assistant director of research at UT Austin Project Males, a mentoring and research initiative committed to advancing equitable educational outcomes for men of color. Dr. Burmiki worked as a higher education and student affairs practitioner for 12 years in the areas of admissions, residence life and housing, student activities and diversity and community engagement. His research can be found in print or forthcoming in the Community College Review, Journal of College Student Development, Professional School Counseling, Journal of Applied Research in Community Colleges, Journal of Education Human Resources, and the Journal of Women and Gender in Higher Education. Dr. Burmiki is a faculty affiliate with North Carolina State's Belk Center for Community College Leadership and Research and UT Austin Project Males. He is an active member of several professional associations, including the Association for the Study of Higher Education, the American Educational Research Association, the American Association of Hispanics in Higher Education, and the National Association of Student Personal Administration. Once again, we welcome you, Jorge Burmiki. The floor is yours. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Figueroa, and thank you everyone at Texas Women's, particularly Dean Hoffman, for supporting these efforts. Um, I'm very excited to be here, of course, to share uh, this platform with you all and also just to learn a little bit more about the work that um, Dr. Figueroa and I were just chatting. Sounds like there's uh, great work going on at Texas Women's, uh, particularly under your division. So I just uh, thank you for, of course, uh, sharing the floor with me and, and being uh, having the opportunity to share a little bit about my work about myself and uh, where I'm going with uh, this work and particularly as it pertains to leadership in higher education. So the title of my presentation tonight is uh, Rethinking Leadership by Design, a Capacity Building Model. Um, and I think um, Dr. Figueroa, you already did such a great job with introducing myself that I'm I, uh, introducing me that I feel like I'm going to be a little redundant with sharing a little bit about my background, but I do think it's important to tell you more about um, not, not just my background, but really some of my professional um, whereabouts, because I do think that that's a big part as a, someone who identifies as a scholar practitioner um, to explain why and how I frame my research in higher education, because I do think that's um, pretty telling of the types of questions that I ask through my research. So a little bit about myself, I'm currently an assistant professor of higher education leadership and policy studies at Howard University. Uh, this is actually my first year, so I'm brand new to the position. And right before that, I was an assistant director of research at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and uh, this is uh, something I want to point out that is specific to also this research is during my time at UT Austin, particularly during Project Males, which is a research and mentoring initiative focused on boys and young men of color. Um, I was able to gain a lot of uh, research experience, of course, as it pertains to men of color in higher education, but also a lot of exposure to administrators, particularly in Texas, uh, which I believe is where most of y'all are. Um, who knows nowadays who's all watching this, right? 
Um, and I was able to uh, really work with a lot of different types of institutions, um, ISDs, K-12 se sector, community colleges, bachelor's degree institutions, um, as well as um, senior leaders in primarily higher education. Um, so that really, again, shaped a lot of the types of questions and a lot of the, the lessons learned that I will be sharing with y'all today. Um, I also received my PhD of, um, of Educational Leadership and Policy, particularly um, with the, from the program of higher education. So a lot of the work that I do is very much framed uh, from a higher education perspective, uh, because that is my area of expertise and that is uh, where I received my PhD. So I just wanted to say that up front so you know how and the type, how I frame my research, but then also the types of scholarship that I'm most um, familiar with. And then last but not least, and I think I already shared this um, already, but I very much identify as a scholar practitioner. And I, uh, prior to starting my uh, journey in academia, I spent quite a few years um, as a student affairs um, higher education administrator, uh, primarily in the areas of admissions, uh, enrollment management, uh, residence life and housing, student activities, and the division of diversity and community engagement. So I'm very interested um, in exploring questions about higher education from the perspective of um, leaders, administrators, uh, practitioners, and, uh, and people that are on the ground doing some of the work um, to promote student success. And then the other thing that I wanna say about my research, particularly as it pertains to some of the, 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 the participants I'll be talking about today, um, as I'm, I'm very interested in questions that revolve around um, historically marginalized leaders within higher education spaces. Um, and a lot of it that comes from my own story, um, navigating a lot of different uh, types of, again, higher education environments, um, and really struggling to see myself represented at the highest levels of leadership within the re institutions that I was uh, I attended both as a student, but then also worked um, as a, an administrator um, for over a decade. So that, it, that does um, impact the way, again, in which I frame my research and my lens for, um, for really um, asking the type of questions that I asked through my research. So that's a little bit about myself. I'm gonna go and, and for the most part, check a little bit of the chat. Um, I see a lot of familiar names uh, there, which is great. Um, and, um, but I won't, I won't be able to respond to them right away. So I'll leave the questions for later um, because I do wanna make sure that's my favorite part of these presentations and questions. So I'll be able to address that. So a little bit of my research. So uh, surprise, surprise, I do a lot of work on leadership in higher education. Um, so that is no surprise given the topic of this lecture. However, I do a lot of work with elite participant research. And I'll talk a little bit about that because that is a very unique type of research that is not necessarily um, particular to higher education, but it's actually very common in other fields, particularly within social sciences. So what is elite participant research? So elite participant research is uh, when you use high ranking or high visibility participants or individuals to engage in methodologically robust studies. And the reason why you don't see a whole lot of research uh, that uses elite participants is because they're, uh, they're participants that are really difficult to recruit for these sort of studies. So there's really not a whole lot on it, given the, the logistical difficulties of doing this sort of work. Typically, you have to establish some report. Uh, you have to um, be very specific about how you go about recruiting participants and, and, and all of those logistics that are difficult to, uh, to again, do uh, you know, on time and, and, and for the purpose of, uh, again, methodologically robust research. So some of the types of high ranking or high visibility um, participants that we might be talking about are elected officials, um, you know, people that are in the public's, uh, uh, public affairs arena, executive leaders, uh, college presidents, which is what I'll be talking about today. And then, as I mentioned, it's not just um, something that is um, you know, that you can find in, in educational research, but it's actually very common in political science and journalism um, because of the types of uh, participants that they tend to um, go after, right? And um, it, it, it got a lot more prevalence as a result of the growth of qualitative methods in social science, primarily the case, the use of case studies, 
Uh, so this is all great background to have, particularly as, as framing research for anyone who's interested in doing research with uh, senior leaders or any type of, again, um, high ranking or high visibility person. Uh, this is definitely um, uh, a, method, a type of methodology that I would highly uh, recommend and, and have, happy to talk more about it. Um, of course, this is not a methods uh, lecture, but it's something that, I, um, that, I, that I've enjoyed doing over the years. Um, it has been applied in higher education specifically or mostly when you really survey the literature uh, for the study of college presidents and other senior leadership positions. And I hear I, I offer some of the scholars that, I'm, that I know I do great work as it pertains to primarily college and university presidents. So that's a little bit about the type of research that informed this particular presentation. Of course, I do other types of work, but this is very specific to what you'll be hearing about today. So again, in terms of higher education leadership, a lot of the projects that inform this presentation is from um, years of doing uh, research with college and university presence. So there's two different studies that, are, that frame the, the, the capacity building model that I'm about to present with y'all today. So one study is specifically with Latinx college presidents, particularly Latinx college presidents that identify as men. And part of it is not a coincidence in that because of the work that I was doing with men of color in higher education, I noticed that a lot of the work that we've done in higher education as it pertains to, um, to men of color, uh, primarily Black and Latinx uh, students, is really at the undergraduate level. There's very little about men of color in higher education beyond um, graduation, actually. Um, and because of, again, my experiences as a higher education administrator um, and then as an Aspire faculty member, I really wanted to understand what are the racialized and gendered experience that these individuals overcome or experience as a result of navigating higher education. And what was their ascension to the presidency like? And a lot of my work was guided by um, really looking at the data and seeing who is and continues to be represented at the highest levels of leadership. And for the most part, Latinx uh, leaders um, and really almost all racial, uh, racially minoritized groups remain highly underrepresented in the leadership pipeline of higher education. And that was very surprising to me when I looked at the data and I saw that less than 5% of all college presidents in the country, which includes all sectors, community colleges, technical colleges, bachelor's degree institutions, less than 5% identify as Latinx, even though the, the, the population growth of our country signals a very different story. So that was it was very clear to me that there was a, a representation problem that needed to be addressed. And as someone who likes to engage in topics about gender and race, I wanted to take that particular look at this population. Something that is important to highlight about this particular study is that because of the types of participants that I was working with, my research led me to doing a lot of work with what I call broadly accessible institutions, which are the types of institutions that promote access to post-secondary education to a higher percentage of low income, first gen and students of color. So those are the types of institutions that I'm very interested in exploring. In addition to MSI settings, which often do a far better job at advancing the leadership outcomes and pathways of racially minoritized individuals. And that is something that is very present in literature and higher education. So that's uh, that one study. The other study regarding college presidents actually was um, based in Texas. Uh, and it was actually, I was invited by the Texas Association of Community Colleges, more so as, um, as an opportunity to conduct and deliver the research uh, but then, so, so the research was primarily focused on community college presidents in Texas uh, and particularly how they go or what do they think is the best way to promote financial aid among community college students. So it was a very financial aid related project. Now, as a researcher, uh, having access to these data and again, knowing how difficult it is to do research with elite participants, I knew that this would be a great opportunity to, do, to use that data to publish more um, information regarding um, college presidents um, in higher, you know, college presidents in general. So there's a couple of studies that I have coming now using these data. So all that to say, although the, the specific questions that I asked for these uh, research studies were not necessarily 
directly related to developing a capacity building model for institutions to, uh, to adopt for promoting the leadership pipeline at their own institutions, these sort of quote unquote lessons learned is what really led me to, um, to do in the presentation that I'm about to do today. So um, this is what I'm gonna be uh, focusing. So now that you know a little bit about my background, the type of research that I did to conduct, to really um, get to this place where I'm talking about this, I wanna talk a little bit about what I call capa capacity building model for institutions that are interested in promoting access to higher education for um, historically minor, um, uh, marginalized populations. So this is a type of model that I suggest for institutions to propel the career of higher education uh, leaders as a better effort to uh, have a leadership pipeline that is more represented, representative, I'm sorry, of the students that we are serving. Because I really do think that ultimately all students deserve to see themselves represented at the highest le levels of leadership. So what is this capacity building model? So the capacity building model includes four leadership L's. And as you can see on this circle, there's not a particular order in which these L's, quote unquote, need to be um, uh, applied. Um, but it's very much a cycle because you can really start from any L and really, uh, the, you know, what I what I believe is uh, deliver results when, when it comes to propelling the career of uh, both uh, emerging leaders and current leaders at uh, your institutions. The first L deals with leveraging your own. And this is very similar to a lot of the grow your own programs that you see at many different sectors in education. Um, but I'm gonna have a, I'm gonna be very specific about some of the tangibles of how, how do institutions, how can institutions create better structures or, or really infrastructure as a whole to leverage their own and really cultivate their own leaders so they can really take on, uh, on higher level uh, leadership positions in the future. The other L leads with leading, um, sorry, uh, deals with leading from within. And again, I'll talk a little bit about what that means. After that, I'll talk about what it means to uh, lead from across, particularly across uh, uh, educational sectors. And last but not least, I'll talk a little bit about learning and unlearning, particularly as it pertains to existing policies and practices that shape the way in which we go about delivering higher education today. So let's just go and start talking about the first leadership L, which is leading from within. So for this particular L, I ask a central question, which is what are institutions doing to enable their leaders to acquire the fundamental competencies for leading the future? Something that we need to be clear is that we need leaders for today and not leaders of, to, of yesterday. We, know we, we really wanna make sure that when we look at the leadership pipeline today, we often see that there's a lot of presidents and leaders that, that are being recycled from other institutions because the institutions don't necessarily trust often the leadership pipeline that is coming, whether from within or other places. So there's a sort of amount of vetting that happens, which is why often it takes forever, you know, as we can see in the data, to diversify the leadership pipeline because we're in many ways, and this is very much grounded in the literature, recycling the same leaders from institution to institution, which really stifles opportunity for emerging leaders that are very much ready to take on some of the issues and, and challenges that we are dealing with today. The other thing, uh, question, which is a sub question of my main question for this particular L, uh, leadership L, is what support systems are in place for leaders to access these opportunities. So I give the example of um, you know, women in leadership in higher education. It's very clear that we know, um, and not just from research, but really as you survey even popular media, that we need to do better at um, really addressing the lack of women in, in executive leadership positions. This is not unique to higher education. It's really unique to many sectors of society. And we believe, we, we know that this is definitely something that we need to prioritize and do better at, particularly as it pertains to women of color in, um, in leadership positions. However, we often put the onus or the blame on the people themselves rather than our own system. So what does that really mean? Something that we have learned, particularly during the pandemic, is that we saw a lot of, um, a lot of women in particular, uh, you know, having to 
quit uh, their jobs. And, and this is sort of how some of these inequities are, were really have been really magnified as we continue to overcome this pandemic as a result of you know, having to take care of the family. So even though we talk about having a more egalitarian uh, society today, we still see the same problem when it comes to um, you know, what we call in, in, in a lot of um, research in sociology, the quote unquote second shift meaning you, you're done with your work job uh, at a, you know, during the day, but you know that you're coming back to the second shift of taking care of the family and all the responsibilities, primarily as it pertains to child bearing. So we know that during the pandemic, and this continues to be a challenge, we saw a lot of uh, loss as it pertains to uh, the progress that we have made with um, women in the workforce as a result of losing some of those systems, like for instance, uh, daycare shutting down, um, school shutting down and really everyone just coming home and having to deal uh, with our day to day lives right. So we know that we can do better and and in particular higher education institutions that are committed to equity and access um, must do better at really promoting support systems that really enable and, 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 and really support the career trajectories of populations that we know that have been historically marginalized at the highest levels of leadership, such as women, women of color, and many other populations that we know that we continue to struggle with when it comes to promoting um, the leadership pipeline. So that's just one way. What are the ways in which our own systems within our own university are perpetuating the inequities because we don't provide the adequate support considering everything that is happening? The other thing is, which uh, I'm very much an asset-based scholar, which deals with really putting the onus on systems rather than the particular individual or, uh, or, or community that we're talking about. Sometimes we, talk, we use deficit language to talk about communities of color, women of color, of like, okay, this is what they're quote unquote lacking rather than here's the assets that they're bringing. So what this model in general calls for is a shift it's a shift of responsibility that deals solely from individuals to systems and institutions. So how can we as a system, and I can and I include myself because I'm very much a part of the higher education system, how can we do better to support the populations that we want to support in the future so that they can get to the places that where we want them to be rather than always putting the focus on the individual. You know, we expect individuals to go about doing their own professional development, you know, for faculty, you know, we have to get grants and all of this stuff to support our research. But what are the ways in which the institution can do better at promoting all of these outcomes? So right here, if I were with you as an audience, I would ask you, what do you see here? And uh, something that um, yeah, obviously we can do that right now because we're on Zoom webinar, but this is supposed to be a rocket. And part of uh, why I wanted to add this visual is because I'm currently doing, uh, reading some of this work that deals with what does it mean for institutions to turbocharge careers? Um, so let's talk a little bit about what that means. What does it mean for institutions to turbocharge careers? So. Um, oftentimes in higher education and really in a lot of different fields, we talk about mentorship quite a bit. So mentorship um, in many ways sort of functions as a one-way street where you have a mentor and you have the mentee. And typically the mentee is the one who gains a lot of the benefits from that relationship, right? However, what this model for turbocharging careers calls for is talking a little bit more about the role of sponsorship. So sponsorship is a little bit different in that it's more of a two-way street in that the sponsor, of course, is the one who is delivering, um, you know, quote unquote, high octane advocacy for that particular person who wants to see their career, you know, uh, you know um, take off. But the sponsor themselves also see the benefits because they really want that person to do well because it also makes them look good. So this is something that I call for institutions through this model to enable more, more opportunities to facilitate um, opportunities for sponsorship between those leaders that are aspiring to higher level positions in addition to those leaders that have already that are in a, in a position of power that can do a, uh, you know, that can probably facilitate better experiences and better opportunities for those that see themselves as future leaders of our institution. So, Again, we talk a lot about mentorship, uh, particularly in higher education research, but we don't really talk enough about the, the meaning and value of sponsorship in propelling the career of, 
uh, careers of future leaders. So that's really what I mean specifically with institutions enabling opportunities to turbocharge careers. The second L leads, um, I'm sorry, deals with leading from across. So what do I mean with leading from across? So back again, I ask a central question. How are institutions promoting opportunities for cross-sector collaborations? So cross-sector collaboration, I, I often mean, particularly in education, we talk about different sectors in education. We have K-12 sector, we have the community college sector, we have the technical colleges sector, we have bachelor's degree institutions, and even within that uh, sector, we have you know, research institutions, regional universities, uh, private universities, public universities, you name it, there's quite a bit. Uh, MSIs, all kinds of different MSIs. Um, so what we know from research is that cross-sector collaborations lead to more partnerships, lead to greater opportunities for networking, and also lead to a stronger pipeline development. Why? Because it is critical that people are talking to each other, particularly across sectors. Again, if I were to be in an audience with you in person, I would ask you, what do you see here? And usually right away, you know, you get all kinds of different answers, but really the purpose of this particular image here is to um, show um, silos. And these are particular grain silos. I don't know much about silos, but what I'm really using this uh, particular uh, metaphor here is that oftentimes, not only do institutions work in silos, but also departments and units and divisions tend to work in silos. And this is something that happens everywhere, but is really, really prevalent in educational institutions. And in fact, when I was um, very recently as an assistant director of Project Mails, um, one of my responsibilities was to do uh, leadership institutes with professionals, particularly in Texas. And I was always shocked when we would put this institutes, uh, we will bring leaders from different sectors. Again, ISDs, which is K-12, um, community colleges, bachelor's degree, you know, all of that. And uh, we will be at a particular region, let's say we're in Houston. And my expectation is that we will be bringing these people together and they would all know each other. They will be talking about, oh, it's been a while that I haven't seen you and all of that. But I was always shocked to see is that very often um, these leaders have never talked to each other. They've never talked to anyone. You know, if I'm, a, I'm a, if I'm at a four year sector, I saw a lot of people that have never talked to someone in the community college sector. They've never talked to someone in the K-12 sector. And this is really problematic. One, because obviously inhibits opportunities to network and partner across uh, sectors, but for education, uh, particular as it pertains to the pipeline of students going through our institutions, it's critical that we work together so we can smooth these pathways, particularly when it comes to transfer pathways. We want to be very clear about what are the ways in which we can partner with each other to accelerate the, the educational outcomes of our students. So bottom line, it is so critical that we're really fostering opportunities to lead from across and that we really break down the silos that often inhibit innovation, inhibit partnerships, and even greater opportunities for networking. The third um, leadership L is leveraging your own. And again, this goes back to sort of grow your own programs that we see growing in many of our institutions. So um, the first thing that I wanna say is that research shows that leaders' uh, behaviors are often influenced by their core beliefs. So this is not surprising. And there's a lot of research that talks about how is it that our core beliefs and values influence the way that we go about leading. Now, something that we also know is that it's really critical for leaders to be able to align core, their core beliefs, their own core beliefs with the institution's mission. And I, and I would argue that it's so critical for whatever next step that you are, that you really look at the university's mission or really whatever educational sector that you're in, that you really look at their mission and core values and ask yourself the question, how does this align with my own core beliefs and values? Because uh, what we know from research is that the best leaders, and oftentimes we know that um, 
um, the, you know, the, the way in which the success of leaders is often quantified by the amount of money that they were able to fundraise, by the, the, the number of buildings that they were, they were able to build during their tenure. But the reality is that the best leaders um, are the ones that are able to fully align their core beliefs with the institutional values and core and mission so that they can deliver better results. And there's more of a you know, harmonious relationship between yourself and the goals of the institution. So a critical question for institutions to ask themselves is how are institutions attuned to their leaders' core beliefs, given what I just shared? Are they listening? Are institutions listening to their faculty, their leaders, their administrators, the people that are, you know, the frontline uh, practitioners that are doing some of the heavy lifting with students, particularly as it pertains right now to the pandemic? There's a lot going on, and it's so critical. And, and, and we know uh, that the morale is, is a little bit low right now because we have very different expectations for this fall. And then, of course, we know what happened with the, the virus and, and, and Delta and, and everything else that's been happening, right? So the morale, we know that's a little bit low among leaders and really across the entire university. And how are the how are institutions staying true to their core mission and values, particularly right now during the pandemic? Um, and this is particularly important to institutions that are truly committed to uh, the things that we care about right here, because I know it's a big part of this um, series. Um, topics about access, equity, and inclusion. How do you really stay to your core values, committed to your core values when there's all this stuff going on in the world? So this particular image right here talks um, or you know, represents uh, some of the pressures that many leaders in higher education are being confronted by, which is, we all know it, fundraising and development and all of that, bringing in more money for the institution. And this is something that used to be just mostly prevalent among uh, executive leadership, primarily with presidents and provosts and whatnot. Um, but now we really see it at all levels of the university. We see uh, deans um, having to really bring in a great deal of fundraising and, and a lot of uh, doing a lot of work related to development. But then we also even see it at mid-level you know, positions like department chairs and all of that, where they feel the pressure to bring in additional funding for their department or units. Uh, so this is very real to higher education as a result of the chronic disinvestment that we've seen over the decades, uh, particularly as it pertains to um, state and federal funding. We see it in federal funding through you know, the value of Pell um, funding that is not the same as it used to be in terms of the proportion of money that actually contributes to um, the cost of higher education. Um, we also see, see it through um, state appropriations, in particular for public universities, that is not proportional to the way in which the cost of college has gone up. And a lot of it has, is a result of really these disinvestments, right? So my point here is that leaders are feeling the pressure. They're feeling the pressure to bring in more money um, as a result of all these barriers that we have been, you know, cooking up for years, right? So something that I learned through my research, particularly when talking to presidents, is, and I have a particular example from a president that I talked to, him, and I remember him saying, you know, some a population that he cares deeply about is uh, DACA and undocumented students. And I did a lot of this research primarily during the Trump administration, where the rhetoric about, and continues to be, and we, we haven't solved this problem at all, particularly as it pertains to DACA and undocumented students. Um, but he talked about how, because of his core beliefs, this goes back to core beliefs, he felt the responsibility to put out a statement that the university supports uh, undocumented students and documented students, because he felt like it was the right thing to do. This is a core value of his, like, you know, we need to, to tell our students that they're safe. We need to tell our students that they are cared for and that they belong here, regardless of what the greater rhetoric is telling you. So again, he felt like this is the right thing to do, right? After that, he put out a statement saying, you know, this is how my university supports, you know, we stand behind uh, undocumented students and documented students, regardless of whatever policy outcomes we see within this administration and beyond, this is the right thing to do. After releasing that statement, he shares that he actually lost 5% of his donor base because they were not pleased by the way he handled this particular situation. 
And what's really ironic is that he said, like, regardless of where you sit in the political spectrum, you know, you're conservative, liberal, progressive, you know, you name it, it doesn't matter. Really, our responsibility is to serve and protect and make sure that our students feel safe so they can serve regardless of who they are. So this should not be a politicized um, um, statement at all. This is just me simply saying, like, we, we got your back because he felt like that was the right thing to do. So again, these are the type of pressures that for institutions, going back to, the, to, to this particular leadership L, how are institutions staying true to their core values, particularly when things get tough as, a, as it pertains to politics and legislation and policies that we know do not benefit the students that we're serving, particularly when we're trying to promote access, right? So it's gonna, it gets tough when you follow your core values but the, 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 the result is that, again, you could lose part of your donor base, which means less dollars. But what's the right thing to do? That's what you got to ask yourself. And that is the responsibility of the institution to, to say, we stay behind your decision. We, we, we believe that these students deserve to be here and they belong here, regardless of what anyone else is telling you. So that is part of that model that, that I'm trying to advocate for, really having your leaders back, particularly when they're following their, their, their core values in times when things are really heated. And we see that right now with COVID and, and, and policies about masks and how it's, it's become politicized, uh, particularly for state universities. Uh, where they might say, you know, you know, you cannot enforce, you know, mask wearing, and despite of, you know, whatever CDC guidelines um, are are there, or, or you know, like people are dealing with this every day. So following your core values um, is something that is critical, particularly when aligned with the uh, with the institution core values or mission. And the last leadership L is learning and unlearning. So what do, I mean with, what do I mean with that? First of all, I go back to asking the central question again, which is how do institutions go about examining their own policies and practices that perpetuate leadership inequities? So that could mean a lot of different things, right? Because we have a lot of policies and practices that are doing some good and some harm. And we know this from our institutions, right? But how do we let go of quote unquote colonial projects, particularly in higher education, that often go about the expense of historically marginalized communities? So when we look at some of the initiatives that often perpetuate things like tokenism, you know, how do we go about letting go of colonial projects, which is uh, again uh, grounded in the literature here? So I'm going to talk about some specifics about what I mean with this because I can see that. For some people, this could get a little lofty. It's like, what do you mean with decolonizing institutional practices? So this is what I mean. So when we ask ourselves a question, how do we let go of colonial projects in higher education? First of all, you could ask yourself a question, uh, which is could be as simple as saying, how do programs and initiatives such as Hispanic Heritage Month, Black History Month, Pride, perpetuate colonial projects in higher education? Do they? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, you know, these are, these are questions that you got to ask yourself as an institution, as leaders, to go farther about the core of the matter, right? The, the, the root cause of where we sometimes see equity. And are we okay, for instance, with these um, initiatives being a one and done thing? You know, are we okay with calling it a quote unquote project? What does that really say about the way in which we go about addressing inequity systematically, right? The other thing that I, I call for is how are we intentionally centering the voices, origins, and histories of Black, Brown, Indigenous, and LGBTQ plus communities? How, how do we go about that? You know, something that um, um, uh, uh, Gina Garcia, a, a scholar that does a lot of work on Hispanic servant institutions, she talks about, you know, a lot of sometimes you, you, you want to, instead of just being, you know, uh, Latinx enrolling, you want to be about serving Latinx students. But oftentimes, many HSIs or even all kinds of MSIs may go, but they might say that they're, you know, quote unquote, serving students, but oftentimes, um, a lot of the people and communities that might be in, in these institutions may not be as familiar or connected to their origins, to their cultural um, roots of what makes this institution, for instance, a Hispanic servant institution. What makes this institution an HBCU? Uh, what makes, makes this institution a tribal college? How do we go back to our roots, to their mission? 
so that we no longer perpetuate these quote unquote colonial projects. So it's really critical that our leaders are deeply connected with the history origins of not only the communities that those institutions are serving, but then also the, the origins of that institution as a whole. What is the purpose of this university and why are we here? So having that connection certainly um, helps for promoting better leadership outcomes. And last but not least, what are the structures um, and you know, also policies? Uh, you know, what, what are the, the, those support structures that we're providing to ensure that women and other minoritized gender identities get at the seat at the table? And this is very much connected to the point that I was trying to make earlier. Again, if we're truly committed to, um, to advancing the populations that we believe should be in leadership positions, we need to be doing the work. And we need to be uh, providing the support structures that, again, I've already emphasized earlier to ensure that these individuals get a seat at the table. All right, so some implications for practice to wrap up here, because I realize that it's getting late and we're all, um, you know, we've all had a long day. Uh, some implications for practice. So first of all, this capacity building model is not meant to be applied all at once. I also realize that different institutions and departments are at different stages of doing equity focus and social justice oriented work. So, you know, for some, uh, this model could be really overwhelming. It's like, how do we even get started? So you can just simply get started with one L. And, and we know that, you know, different schools are at different levels and also different schools are at different places in terms of being ready to really do equity focused work. Um, so that really depends on the institution because I really don't believe that this is a one size fits all model. All institutions are different and they have different needs and there are different stages. So I say that I say this because although I try to, you know, provide um, some you know, some base level um, capacity building strategies here, just to get the ground running, I realized that this is not a one size fits all approach because we all have different needs and histories and origins and, and reasons why we do this work. Um, and last but not least, these questions in this model can be used for strategic planning for leaders to think more critically about organizational leadership and success. So, you know, uh, I believe in strategic planning. I believe in succession planning. I think these are the type of questions that are really important for institutions to ask themselves as they seek to promote, um, you know, greater equity and social justice oriented work. So this could be very much used at a strategic planning retreat, this could very much use at a board meeting where they're really trying to tackle the leadership pathway uh, or pipeline in higher education in their own institution. Um, and really just to, again, ask more critical questions about how are we supporting our own? How are we growing our own? How are we really providing better pathways for our own leaders to do better? 